get comfy, get cozy, grab a warm drink, grab some Hanukkah gelt, join us with your Hanukkah candles, go grab those, which will light in a moment. I'm Ariella Mortkowitz, the founding director of Sviva, and we are so excited to see new faces and not so new faces tonight. Um, please, if I don't know you, make sure to introduce yourself in the chat or stay at the end to say hi for a bit. I promise I won't run off. I would love to know you. I'm going to say 30 seconds about Sviva because tonight's gathering is so Sviva, it's crazy. Sviva is about creating a more nourishing communal faith experience for Jewish women where we define both Jewish and women very broadly. If you want to be here with us, we want you with us and welcome. We love that we are multi-generational and diverse in background and affiliations. We come together in celebration of women, our strengths, our unique perspectives, our ways of contributing to the world. And everything that we do, every bit of what you see tonight, ever, every gathering that we ever create is always inspired and designed by you, of us, by us, and for us. Sviva is about carving out a space in the Jewish community that is completely dedicated to the communal and spiritual needs of women. And we are unapologetic about answering our own needs for ourselves in gathering as we need to, with who we need to, why we need to, to talk about what we need to. And we hope tonight is just one of the many times that we get to see your face because we have a lot planned for 2021 around the corner. I'm gonna share the Sviva rules so that we could just quickly go over those. I just wanna remind you of these. Please respect everyone here. We ask you to show up as your fabulous self, a hot mess, laundry piles, all of it. We love it all. What, happen, what happens here stays here. And please, please introduce yourself to someone new tonight. Compliment someone's artwork hanging behind them or ask them where they got their throw pillow or tell them that they <laughs> remind you of your absolute favorite cousin. But just say hi, because I can assure you that you are each fantastic humans and you should all know each other. Also, again, just please make sure that your name is listed as you would have it um, listed on a name tag if we were in person and chat away. The chat feature will be heavily used tonight and we expect you guys to learn with and from each other and get to know each other as best we can. So please start off by introducing yourself in the chat. Tell us where you are, your favorite Hanukkah present that you got, <laughs> anything you want to share. We want to know you. Um, but with that, I get to introduce one of my favorite women. This is my beautiful daughter, Tara. I am biased, I know. What, you can come around this way. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'll unplug so you can hear her too. Um, and she's going to lead us in lighting Hanukkah candles tonight. So um, Andrea, if you can share the bracha, the blessing, you can attach the file in the chat or put it up on screen. Tara is going to get us started. I'll say, I can send the file actually. I've got it right here. All right. You guys, everybody ready? Hang on. Let me get the Hanukkah blessings. There they are. They're in the chat. Okay, great. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Mecham Asher Kitanu B'Yisraelah Amen. 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 Awesome. Thank you so much, Carlu. And now I get to introduce Rabbi Eliza Sperling, the director and visionary behind all of her Torah. 
and you'll see Aliza's bio in the chat and she's going to tell us why we're here tonight. Thank you, Ariella, and thank you, Tara. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to Her Torah's celebration of Chag Habanot. Chag Habanot, which some of you, many of you, have, may have not heard of before. I had not heard of it before this year. It's also known as Eid al Banat, and it's a beautiful holiday that celebrates women's friendship, wisdom, and courage. It's celebrated in mostly North African Jewish communities to honor Jewish women. And it's generally celebrated on the first of the Jewish month of Tevet. So today we're doing it actually one night afterwards. And, um, and it's really exciting to be able to do this with you. There's a great organization in Israel, it's called Haluz Ha'ivri. And it tries to take holidays that different Jewish communities had celebrated in their wherever they come from and bring it back into the Israeli mainstream and into the Israeli calendar. So that um, you may have heard of the holiday called Sigd or the Mimuna. And so Chag Habanot is one of those holidays that we don't want to have get lost because it's such a beautiful holiday. We want to we want to keep it. Um, and we especially love Chag Habanot here at Her Torah because it's all the things that we aspire to be. It's multi-generational, it celebrates women, it celebrates women's friendship and courage. It's about learning about other women and learning from other women. And so it really has a special place in my heart as I've been uh, learning about it. It's thought that Chag Habanot is celebrated on the first day of Tevet because two really significant events in the Bible and Tanakh happen then. One of them is that Queen Esther, before she was queen, was taken to the house of Ahasuerus on that day. And that set in motion uh, her uh, deliverance of the Jewish people. The other thing uh, is that when the Jewish people came back to the land of Israel from Babylonia, uh, the Jewish men committed to building Jewish families on that day. And so it perhaps those are the reasons that the first day of Tevet was specifically taken to be this holiday of women. It also commemorates two Jewish heroines of Hanukkah, Judith, the woman who dressed up and then went and beheaded the Assyrian king, and also um, Hana, the daughter of Matityahu, who was able to go and get her brothers, who weren't really getting up and doing anything, to go and start fighting against the Syrio Greeks. Chag Habanot was celebrated in Tunisia, Morocco, Libya, Algeria, Turkey, Salonika. Women of all ages would come together to learn together, dance and sing, and women would give gifts to each other. Delicious treats, especially honey pastries, would be served. And actually, at this point, I would love to ask any of you who may have memories of celebrating Chag Habanot, or who may have heard from their families about a celebration of Chag Habanot, to tell us about it in the chat. Um, I have. I actually got the a chance to recently speak with someone who remembered her childhood in Tunisia, where her family got together and they celebrated Chag Habanot, complete with belly dancing, and it sounded really fun. So if you have memories of Chag Habanot, please put it in the chat. In some communities, this day would be especially celebrated by engaged couples, where they would send gifts to each other, while in other communities, it was a special holiday for single women. In some communities, women would ask for forgiveness from one another as on Yom Kippur. In other communities, they would make a celebration for all the girls who were to become bat mitzvah that year, after which the women would all go up to kiss the Torah. Tonight, as part of our celebration, we will try to integrate some of these traditions. I wish we could have the honey pastries, but that will have to wait until we can all get together in person. We will, however, celebrate great Jewish women by having three fantastic teachers, Maharat Victoria Sutton, Tamar Zaken, and Rabbi Tsipi Gabai, teach us about Sephardic heroines you may have never heard of before. I know that I was blown away when I heard about these incredible women, and we are so blessed to learn about them tonight. Thank you to our teachers tonight. Thank you to Sarah Levine from Jimena. Jews indigenous to the Middle East and North Africa, 
who directed us to Tamar and Rabbi Tzipi. Thank you to the Aviv Foundation and Maharat for co-sponsoring tonight's session, for all that you do for Jewish education, and for believing in us. We are going to start our celebration by celebrating the girls who are going to be bat mitzvah this year, or who have recently become bat mitzvah. If you are past the age of 12, but you are studying to become an adult bat mitzvah, we are celebrating you too. Please let us know that you are a bat mitzvah girl by renaming yourself on Zoom so that it says your name and then it says bat mitzvah. So for instance, if your name is Daphna, please rename yourself so that your Zoom square says Daphna bat mitzvah. In Tunisia, bat mitzvah age girls would be celebrated by the community and would receive a special blessing from the rabbi. Tonight, we are going to celebrate the bat mitzvah girls by asking all of you to write a blessing to the bat mitzvah girls in the chat. Please phrase it this way. I bless you to be like my friend or relative, so-and-so, fill in the blank, who taught or teaches me about fill in the blank. For instance, I bless you to be like my mother who teaches me about acting with unassuming kindness every day. Or I bless you to be like my friend Ariella who never lets anything, even COVID, keep her down. While you write your blessings in the chat, we will have the great honor of Rabbi Tzipi Gabai and percussionist Katya Cooper performing for us a traditional Moroccan song to honor the bat mitzvah girls. Rabbi Tzipi Gabai is a gifted spiritual leader and teacher who uses relevant stories, music, and her beautiful voice to create joyful, sacred environments for services she performs. As the, she is the daughter of the chief Sephardic rabbi in Northern Israel, who was banished from Morocco and moved to Israel in the mid 1900s. Rabbi Gabai broke many barriers to become ordained as a rabbi at the Academy for Jewish Religion in Los Angeles in 2003. She is the world's first female rabbi of Moroccan descent, representing the 21st generation of rabbis in her family. Wow, Rabbi Tzipi, that's amazing. Fluent in Hebrew, English, and Arabic, and knowing both Ashkenazi and Sephardic traditions and services, Rabbi Gabai seamlessly combines the traditional and the contemporary, reading and chanting from the Torah in a variety of styles. She has a special passion for studying and teaching Piyutim, ancient Sephardic sacred poetry. I will let you read in the chat the rest of her amazing biography. Rabbi Tzipi and Katya, we're so lucky to have you with us. Thank you. תודה רבה, שוקרן, סלאם עליכום, שלום עליכם, and Eid al-Banat Sameach, Happy Holiday. I, we, we will start with the piyut, and I hope the paitan, we don't know his name, forgives me, he wrote it a few hundred years ago, he wrote it for the chatani, for the grooms, Isma chatani, may my, may my beloved ones be rejoicing in the company of the believers, but I changed it, and they usually sing it for the bar mitzvah, and for the weddings, but I changed the words to Tismach Kalati, my beloved ones, the Kala, the Bat Mitzvah girl, may she rejoice. So you can look at the, the you will probably have on the screen uh, the translation of the, um, the Piyut, the transliteration, and the, uh, the translation. Yes, Tismach Kalati Bikhal Emunai. So this is in honor of all the Bnot Mitzvah. Tismach Kalati Bikhal Emunai Tisa Berachah Met Adonai Tismach Kalati Bikhal Emunai Tisa
want to come up for dinner or anything? We're gonna just Jake's coming over. We're just gonna. Okay, well, if you have no place to go, let me know. We'll definitely have you up. What, you want another song? <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you so much, Rabbi Tsipi and Katya. That was incredible. Thank you. Okay, Jessica, ready? I am. That was so cool. I'm so excited sitting in front of my Hanukkah candles that we lit about, I don't know, a half an hour ago before we started. Um, I have the honor to introduce some of the Sviva leadership team. So I'm going to ask those of you who are here to give a wave. I saw Sherry and Sherry and Andrea, Sandra. I don't know if she's with us yet. And Rebecca, I'm not sure she's joined. Um, along with myself, we've been helping Ariella um, to build this amazing community with all of you. I think a lot of you know that we're moving into our second year of her Torah, and it's become such a vibrant, energized, deeply valuable program. You might not know that we've actually gathered 14 times this year, and we've engaged 45 incredible educators and facilitators. We've partnered with 24 different communal projects that help make women's lives better, easier, and richer. And most importantly, we've met, as my kids like to say, literally, but I mean it, thousands of you. And the idea behind Sviva is to invest in you, to invest in us. We know that so much of the rest of the Jewish community, and sometimes it feels like the rest of society was not designed as women would design for themselves. Sviva is an experiment in exactly that, figuring out what conversations we need to be having, what learning we want to be doing, highlighting where we shine, and building a community as only women can. Sviva comes from the Hebrew saviv, like a sevivon, a dreidel spinner, to surround her. That's what Sviva does. That's what you do for each other. Tonight, I'm going to ask you, to ask all of you, Sviva needs you. This pandemic is hurting so much hurting so many nonprofits out there, and Sviva is no exception. What makes us different is that we've kept on going, we've added, we've built, we've actually grown bigger, but we actually could and should be doing more, Sviva. You as a community come together so naturally and beautifully, and you find each other and connect with each other through little boxes and Zoom chats, and you find each other's hearts, and it is amazing, just like that bracha we just heard. And we don't want to stop. We have so much planned, but we need your help in making it possible. Please help us pay our speakers and our educators. On principle, one of our core founding values is that we don't ask them to do anything for free ever because women are always asked to give their time and talent away and we forget how to value ourselves. Whatever you can give tonight, whatever you can pay when you come and participate in these events, each dollar goes far. So in advance, we thank you all for joining us in supporting Sviva. You can go to, and I think um, we'll drop it in the chat, www.sviva.org backslash donate with all of our gratitude. We're trying to meet our year end goal of $20,000. We'd love you to consider sponsoring an upcoming Her Torah gathering in honor of a fabulous woman in your life. If that feels too daunting to do it by yourself, then find a group of friends or reach out to us and we will help you do that. And please, if you have something to add to Sviva, please be in touch. 
We want your time, your skill, your ideas, you name it. You have all our email. Please let us know if you'd like to get more involved because really we want you to. Chag Sameach. Thank you so much, Jessica. And now we have the amazing opportunity to hear from our teachers and learn about these Jewish women who are so incredible. And I mean, I had never heard of them before. Our first speaker is Maharat Victoria Sutton. Maharat Victoria and I never overlapped at Maharat. She graduated in 2014, yeah? And I graduated five years later. But every time I spoke with her in preparation for tonight, I found myself wishing that we had spent time together. Maharat Victoria is the Director of Education and Community Engagement at Congregation Beth Israel in Berkeley, California. She was ordained, as I said, through Yeshivat Maharat in 2014. A graduate of Barnard College with a BA in bio Biological Sciences, she also holds a Grand Diploma in Pastry Arts from the French Culinary Institute in Manhattan. That's amazing. She has done wonderful things. She was the Rabbinic Fellow for Synagogue Initiatives at the Shalom Hartman Institute of North America and the Intern for Synagogue Education at Oav Shalom, a modern Orthodox synagogue in Merrick, New York. Prior to stepping into a clergy role, Victoria was involved with community organizations in New York City, focusing on homelessness, literacy, sexual assault, and domestic violence. Thank you to Yeshivat Maharat for your support in bringing Victoria here to teach us tonight. And thank you to Maharat Victoria. Well, um, I just wanna say it is so, so wonderful to be here with all of you. It's just incredible to see all of your faces and so uplifting to be here to celebrate the bat mitzvah um, girls and their families. So I'm a Zaltov and I'm a Brook to them. Um, and uh, by a show of hands, um, anybody um, here, um, if you just want to just do a little show of hands, um, have you heard before of uh, Farha or Flora Sassoon? Okay, shaking heads. She's been a little bit, um, a little bit more in the news lately, so we'll learn a lot more about her um, this evening. Um, and if anybody um, is uh, is from the Iraqi community. Um, so I'm from the Syrian community, um, but I'm sharing about Farha tonight because she's such an incredible woman, but I would love to hear if anybody is from the Iraqi community, if you wanna share as the lecture goes on, I'll check the chat afterwards and maybe you can share um, some other knowledge and, and uh, that you have of her. So I'm gonna share my screen. Great. Okay. Um, so uh, Farha or uh, Flora Sassoon, um, Flora Gabe was born in 1859 in Bombay um, in India. Her mother Aziza was a descendant of the Sassoon family and she was named actually after her great grandmother Farha Sassoon. Her father was Ezekiel Gabe, also a Baghdadi Jew. Um, Farha comes from the Arabic word for joy, similar to the name Simcha in Hebrew and is used similarly to describe like a farah, like a happy occasion. The Sassoons were a very well-known Baghdadi family they were founders of the Jewish community in Bombay, and they were also known as the Rothschilds of the East. They were involved in the opium trade, among other ventures, and they were significant in the larger scene in Bombay, as well as in Shanghai and, uh, and in Hong Kong. Um, Farha was educated privately by tutors and rabbis who had been brought to India from Baghdad, and she also attended a private Catholic school. It seems to have not been uncommon for the elite families in Bombay to invite the Chachamim from Baghdad to teach their children privately in their homes. And the family was also devout in their practice of Judaism. Flora received a remarkable education and background in Jewish text, and she spoke seven languages. I'm gonna go back to the slideshow for a second. Okay. I'm just going to pull up the next slide. Let's try that again. Okay, there we go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so 
on the left, you see um, um, Farha and her husband, Suleiman. She was a granddaughter of the Sassoon dynasty through her mother, but she also married into the Sassoon family. She married her uncle, uh, Suleiman, in 1876. Uh, he had led the family business and he was devoted to Jewish learning and practice. For example, they had a private synagogue in their home. On the right, here's a picture of their home in Bombay. And they had three children, David, who was named for the patriarch of the Sassoon family, uh, Rachel and uh, Moselle. In 1894, her husband died and Flora undertook managing the entire operation of the family's business throughout the 1890s and all of the other obligations of her late husband. That meant keeping up a very successful business and a busy private life, her husband having been a leader and a philanthropist for Jews in India and abroad. Despite suspicious and doubtful family members and business partners that um, she wouldn't be up to the task, she not only succeeded in maintaining this enterprise, but raised profits worldwide. And with her acumen and wit, she was able to achieve what no other woman in that day and age did. Following a serious plague in Bombay and the spread of cholera, she supported a young Jewish bacteriologist um, and de who developed an effective vaccine. And she led a campaign to get the population inoculated despite the reservations of both Hindus and Muslims. And she was also actively involved in the anti purda movement of women who were veiled and secluded. In 1902, she moved to London following the incorporation of the family business. Um, Flora and family were extremely philanthropic in the London Jewish community, founding the Jewish hospital, among other supports. And it seems that the London branch of the family and the London community, perhaps, that she was uh, um, involved with was less traditional than, than Flora and her family were used to um, in their Jewish practice. And she notes in a number of her speeches and writings, which we'll see in a moment, about the importance of passing Torah scholarship and halakha and Jewish practice to the next generation. Farah was famous for her dinner parties and her Shabbat afternoon teas, and she entertained all manner of people. And strictly kosher feasts were served, and she held court with scholarly conversation with people from all walks of life. She continued to study, speak, and write. Some of her writings were published in the Jewish form and we'll soon see one of her speeches. She not only possessed a keen knowledge of Talmud, citing passages freely and frequently, she was also knowledgeable in other rabbinic literature like shoot, response to literature, rabbinic writings and figures, and even rare or unpublished manuscripts. Flora and her son David seem particularly focused on the traditions and writings of the Middle Eastern Jewish communities. And the Sassoon family collection, which contains not only um, Judaica, such as beautiful Torah scrolls, um, the, the, the gold and silver cases, but also many, many rare manuscripts um, that her and her son David um, spent much time curating and her daughter Rachel as well. And it's actually going to be featured in auction at Sotheby's tomorrow. So people can go check the Sotheby's uh, website. And there's a whole story on, uh, on the Sassoon family there. Um, notably, Flora corresponded with esteemed rabbis of the day. She had an ongoing correspondence with Rabbi Yosef Chaim of Baghdad, who had begged her to return to visit Baghdad. She ended up visiting only a year after he passed away. The Ben Yishchai acknowledges Flora in his book in Rebina, which is pictured here, um, in a set of riddles on names, including hers. So uh, in some of these complicated and playful riddles, um, he, he um, pays um, homage to, to Flora. <laughs> she also corresponded with Rabbi Yitzhak Nisim, uh, who was also a Baghdadi rabbi, who was a young rabbi at the time, and he later became the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel. Um, they corresponded on various matters of halakha, of Jewish law, and actually Nisim included a number of halakhic questions um, and correspondence in his book of response, pictured here, um, Yayin Hatov. And uh, what we have pictured here is um, he notes a question about hand washing and when one says the bracha on hand washing and other, other mitzvot um, that are process oriented. And I'll just read um, a little bit here. I didn't put this, this is from the, the 
published version. Um, he says, Mishalti Meharabani Tanoda So I was asked from the Rabbanit, um, who was very well known and the very famous mistress, Farcha, um, the wife of Hassar Hamanuach Saliman David Sasson, the wife of uh, Saliman David Sasson, who had passed away by now. Um, and then she asks a very detailed question um, about when does one say the blessing on um, hand washing in the morning? Um, and cl she clearly shows she, she's familiar with many texts because she says, do, does one bless before drying the hands as the Shulchan Aruch quotes, or does one bless after washing the hands as is written in many of the Achronim, um, the writings that came after the Shulchan Aruch? And what is the right way to do it? Um, please let me know. So that's uh, one, one example of a number of examples um, in the book that he includes questions from her. Um, whenever she traveled, um, her and her family would be accompanied by um, a, an entourage so she could pray with a minyan. Um, she would also have a shechet, a ritual slaughterer and a cook and her son traveled in this way as well to ensure that they would always have kosher food and um, be able to keep up with the Torah readings and keep up with, uh, um, with the prayers in the proper way. Um, and her travels, she met with sages and head rabbis in Syria and Baghdad. And most famously, when she and her entourage visited Baghdad in 1910, um, a year after uh, the Ben Ishchai had, had passed away. In 1924, um, Flora was invited to deliver a speech at Jews College in London um, to the rabbinical students, um, and it was later published. And she notes in the speech that she was pleased to be asked to be the first lady chairman um, 20 years after having presided over a speech there. Um, she spends a, a bunch of time in the beginning sort of talking about both the novelty of her being a woman. She was the first woman in the 70 year almost tradition of the university to speak. Uh, but she also acknowledges women throughout the tradition. She mentions Deborah and on the page I'm noting here, she freely quotes a number of um, cases in the Talmud where women um, were involved. So she quotes here from Kitubot that women used to anoint the head of the disciples with oil. So not only the Talmud, but she's quoting Rashi's opinion there on what this section means. Um, and that women had this privilege because they would raise up their children and take them to the Beit Midrash. I think it was actually quite brilliant of her um, using the source in this way. Um, on the other hand, on the one hand, she was quite scholarly herself. On the other hand, she's speaking now to rabbis, heads of communities and educators. And what she's focusing on is passing on the tradition to the next generation. Um, and the importance of a woman's role in that and her role in that as well as a philanthropist and scholar. Um, throughout the speech, she, um, the page that I'm showing here, um, she continues to quote text. For example, she quotes the Yerushalmi here, um, or the Jerusalem Talmud, which is much less well known um, and quoted. And um, she urges the rabbis um, and impresses upon them how needed they are, how important their role is um, in terms of the, the way that people feel that she, she sees that people are treating Judaism and Torah scholarship in her days. They're not taking it as seriously as she would like. And also urges philanthropists to be able to um, allow the school to continue. So she both raises the rabbi rabbinical students up um, and then she also, you know, impresses upon them what she thinks their role is. And from a position where she stands in 1924, um, after you know, having been this, this amazing philanthropist um, and scholar, um, we, we imagine that they took her words quite seriously. Um, another one of her articles here was published, um, was on Rashi, um, Rav Shlomi Yitzchaki, who was a foundational Torah and Talmudic commentator. And in this article, Flora demonstrates deep knowledge of Rashi's commentary and also his less, less well-known responsa. And she weaves in knowledge throughout the article um, of rare manuscripts from Sephardic lands um, to compare with Rashi, um, who is an 11th century North French scholar's understanding of certain texts. Um, for example, she brings a story of a simple uneducated Jews, like real Ameha Aret, she says, it, who live in Northern Mesopotamia and who still spoke Aramaic. And they use the same term as the Talmud for these small sticks of wood, um, which Rashi makes sure to translate in his commentary based on the tradition he received from the Babylonian, i.e. 
Iraqi <laughs> um, Geonim, um, as Aramaic was no longer spoken in his time and place. So clearly putting forth um, the significance and importance of maybe these less well-known or less well-studied um, traditions from, from Babylon and throughout um, the Middle East. Um, in the article, she also brings praiseworthy citations of Rashi's views on women um, in some of his responsa and discusses the lives of his illustrious daughters. As we know, Rashi um, had, had daughters. There are other articles of Flores as well as interviews that were published in the 20s and 30s. Flora and her son David and their daughter-in-law Selena starting in 1933 um, saved a number of German Jews by providing work for them in England. And just one example of, of the significance of the place that they held in the not only Bombay community and London community, but in the worldwide Jewish community. <laughs> Um, Farhat died in 1936 in the month of Tibet, um, which we now find ourselves, and she was buried on Har Hazatim in um, Jerusalem. Um, she was um, Zionist um, in, her, um, in her beliefs as well. Um, when she died, Chief Rabbi Herzog eulogized her as, and I quote, a living well of Torah, of piety, of wisdom, of goodness and charity, and of the staunchest loyalty to tradition, and out of her wonderful well, Israel could draw in abundance, noble incentives and lofty inspiration. So Farhad Flora Sassoon was clearly an exceptional woman, um, exceptional in her scholarship and exceptional in her accomplishments. And also I think important to note, exceptional in the access and in the platform that she had. Um, and by no means um, do I say this to minimize her vast knowledge and commitment to scholarship in her own personal scholarship and philanthropic support for scholars and institutions, but she had access to a superior education, access to a dazzling array of literature and manuscripts of scholars of the past that was unparalleled. I think even great yeshivot at that time, great schools of learning did not have the same access to the manuscripts and um, direct access to um, Torah scholars that she did. And the intimate correspondence that she had on matters of religious law and questions with the chief scholars and head rabbis of the day. Um, and for her social position and reputation, she was also given a platform with which to share her scholarship. She could write, she was invited to write and to speak. For me, and maybe perhaps for others, um, here. I know I speak only for myself, but this might ring true for others. Um, the matriarchs of our family 150 years ago may not have access, have had access to literacy, whether secular or Judaic, um, and let alone be trained in Jewish scholarship. Um, my grandmother, you know, my mother joined the call a little bit before, so I have some family members here, um, so she'll correct me if I'm wrong. But they grew up in observant traditional homes, but they weren't even taught to, to really read Hebrew and, and read Jewish texts properly. Um, and I think by celebrating someone as exceptional as Farha Sassoon, um, it's important to note just how exceptional she was. Um, and that's in no way um, to measure a woman's impact. There's no one way to measure a woman's impact on her community um, or on the world. Um, even if one's sphere of influ influence may seem small <laughs> compared to the grandeur of Farha Sassoon, it's immeasurable to those whose lives she has touched. She has enriched and she has impacted. And so I encourage all of us, um, as we lift up um, Farha Sassoon's life, we also are lifting each other up and the women who are in our lives. And so I encourage all of us um, to put in the chat um, someone who you see as a heroine, a matriarch, or a friend who had left an imprint on your family um, or on your life. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maharat Victoria. I, I love um, learning about uh, Flora Sassoon, both because of how much she accomplished, but also because when you read her stuff, she is not afraid to speak truth to power, maybe because she is power herself. Um, and I love the way that you kind of um, reflected on, on our own thinking, you know, we may not be Flora Sassoon's and have that kind of platform, but to think about what we can do is really um, a great way, something that I'm going to be thinking about a lot um, tonight. So thank you. Our next speaker is 
Tamara Zaken. Tamara is a Jewish educator based in the Bay Area. For many years, Tamar directed service learning programs at Mimizrach Shemesh, the Center for Jewish Social Activism based in Jerusalem. She currently serves as Chief Program Officer at Hamakom, the place in Berkeley, California. So it happens to be that out of total circumstance, our three teachers tonight all basically live near one another, um, which is there. That just means that they're lucky because they get to see each other. Um, in her spare time, Tamar translates Sephardic rabbinic texts to expose English speaking audiences to their inspiring message of inclusion and justice. Thank you so much to Sarah Levine at Gemina for connecting us with Tamar. In this short time that I've known Tamar, she has taught me so much about the richness of Sephardic heritage, and I'm so excited to learn about the great learned women that she will present tonight. Thank you so much, Aliza, and really wonderful to see everyone um, here tonight. Um, so we're going to learn about um, two women. Um, we're going to kind of hop back a couple hundred years from um, Flora Sasson, and I'm so glad to have learned uh, about her from you, uh, Margaret Victoria. Thank you. Um, but we're going to start with a. Um, I have. It's hard. Uh, all of us Jewish educators have had to adjust to Zoom, um, but I still want to be interactive, right? So <laughs> um, I'm going to put in the chat a Padlet. Um, maybe you guys have done Padlet a bit before. Um, and um, the Padlet asks you to think of a woman, um, a wise woman in your life, um, and to um, choose a woman from your life who inspires you and what did this woman teach you about um, about learning so it could be a parent it could be a teacher um, what what did that who was that person and what did they teach you about learning um, I'm going to share the padlet so you can all see it if you're not on it um, you can we'll look at it together and we'll um, slowly see what people write. Um, I can share that, <clears throat> um, and I see that I'm doing this to my my kids. But my mom would always kind of sit with me and do like, you know, remind me to do my homework and tell me learning is really important. You have to do your homework; it affects your future, um, that kind of thing. Um, I see we have. Um, a, um, a Savta Lea who taught um, this um, person to read Hebrew, um, that there are infinite amount of opinions, however crazy, oh, they're hopping around, so I'm missing them. So we see all these beautiful, um, beautiful sharings of these wise women who have taught us so much about learning. And I want us to think about these women and, and these different contributions. And, and you guys can, um, we'll, we'll, we might hop back to this, um, but I'm gonna stop the share for a moment um, and we're gonna look at some sources together. So, one second, sorry, let me just. Ah, uh, okay. One second, sorry. Okay. Um, so we're gonna learn today about <clears throat> two women. The first one doesn't have a name. Um, her, in, in the literature that I read, she's referred to as the Virgin of Algeria um, and one of my favorite Sephardic rabbis, Harav Yosef Massas, um, refers to her in this book called Nachalat Avot. Um, he had read some manuscripts that, were, that um, talked about this, this woman. And we're gonna read what Harav Yosef Massas, who's a rabbi who was born in Algeria in 1892, he, um, he was the chief rabbi of, of um, he was the rabbi of uh, 
Tlemcen, I don't know if I'm saying that right, maybe uh, uh, Tsipi can correct me because it's a city, I mean, it's a city in, in Algeria, but um, maybe a part of it. Um, and then he, he um, made Aliyah in, in the 60s and became the, the chief rabbi, the head rabbi of Haifa. But um, we're going to look at one of his texts. So <clears throat> um, I'll read it. He was born in Morocco. That city is in Morocco. Oh, so it's in Morocco. Yeah. Um, I saw in a manuscript book that in the city of Algeria, or Algiers, in the time of the Gaon Rabbi Ayash, may his memory protect us, there was a beautiful virgin who was the daughter of a wealthy man. She was wise in Torah and devoted herself day and night to Torah study. Many honorable people sought her out as a bride, yet she was not the least bit interested in marrying for, this, for the same reason as Benazai, her soul desired Torah. So let's look at this text for a moment and try and kind of understand as much as we can about this woman. We don't know her name, but what can we learn about her? And if someone just wants to call out I, I, or, or unmute yourself and share, that would be great. Um, I know that we're a big group, but I do like to hear voices and sometimes it's hard for me to see the chat. What can we learn about this woman? What do we know about her? Just things that pop out from this text. She was interested in ideas. She had okay. a craving for intellectual growth. Right, she was interested in, in ideas and intellectual growth and in Torah study. In That's Torah right. study. And that was more exciting to her <laughs> than being right. married and raising a family. Okay, right. Um, what else? That, that, that's awesome. Thank you so much. What, what other things do we learn about her from this text? We know that she does want, she does want to focus on learning. What other characteristics does she have? She was a woman of means. Right, right. So she's wealthy. Um, she's, she has kind of that access to, um, like to, to wealth and to power and to power in that way. Um, and we know she's very beautiful. She's sought after. So there's probably a lot of people wanting to, to marry her. Um, and, and, and in this manuscript that describes her, she, when, when she's asked about, um, getting married, she gives this, this um, she refers to a rabbi from the Talmud, Ben Azai, um, that her soul des um, desires Torah. And um, uh, any, anyone here heard of Ben Azai? I kind of like Ben Azai and I have a little personal story about Ben Azai I might tell later. But um, Ben Azai um, was known, to, he never married. Um, and I'll show, let me, if the slide will switch, um, we're gonna just for a moment, Look at this story from the Talmud about Ben Azai. Just refer so we understand that quote that this woman re refers to. Um, so she, she, this is um, from Tractate of Amot. But you who have never married expound well on the importance of procreation, and yet you do not fulfill your own teachings. Ben Azai said to them, what shall I do as my soul yearns for Torah and I do not wish to deal with anything else? It is possible for the world to be maintained by others who are engaged in the mitzvah of being fruitful and multiplying. So the rabbis are kind of talking to Ben, ben Azai and saying, well, you, you keep saying how important it is, this mitzvah of being fruitful and multiplying, but you're actually not doing it. And Ben Azai says to them, but I love the Torah so much. I want to, to devote myself to Torah study. The, the rest of the world will continue and be maintained if everyone else engages in this mitzvah of having children. Um, and so this woman who doesn't have a name, who's living um, 
around, if we, um, we saw in the text, in the earlier text, she's living around the time of Rabbi Yehuda ben Yitzchak Ayash. This is the uh, Gaon Ya'ash that, uh, Ayash that they're referring to. So it's around the 18th century um, Algeria. Um, so she knows, she knows the Talmud she, um, and she is referring to Ben Azai, um, but still what happens is her father is really worried about her because he knows that her um, social standing will be affected if she doesn't ever get married. And he sends this woman to Haravayash, to, to Chachamayash, to talk through it with, her, with him so that he can kind of convince her to get married. Um, and so then we see this text um, and she says, so I'll, I'll read, this is actually the, um, source from Nacharat Avot from uh, Harav Masas, and her father complained about her to the above Gaon and sent for her and spoke kindly to her saying good things, but she was unwilling to obey him on the basis of Kal Vachomer from Ben Azai. So I'll explain that in a moment. He is a man commanded to be fruitful and multiply, and nonetheless he said, what can I do? My soul yearns for Torah. And how much more is, um, is this so with, with regard to her who is not commanded to be fruitful and multiply? So um, for those of you who don't know, kal v'chomer is a, is a kind of legal reasoning that comes up in the Talmud. Um, that, um, so it's like a heavy case and a more, a, a, more um, a strict case and a more lenient case. So, um, there's the example here with Ben Azai. Ben Azai is saying, uh, according to the Torah and the rabbis, the, the mitzvah, the commandment of having children is on the man, not on the woman. And so if Ben Azai is able to explain his way out of not getting married, and he is actually obligated, according to the rabbis, to be fruitful and multiply and have children, how, how can it be that she would have to get married if she's not commanded to actually be fruitful and multiply? Um, and so she uses this very, um, you know, smart, um, obviously she, she knows how to debate and, and, and use Talmudic reasoning um, to, to, to get out of, of getting married. And she actually doesn't get married um, and she continues to study Torah. Um, so I think I really love this story. I think one of the things that is sad is that there aren't texts that she wrote, um, but we learn about her from, um, from this small um, excerpt from Harav Masas' book. Um, the second um, woman we're learning about today is um, a Kurdish woman, and uh, her name's uh, Osnat Barazani. Um, I, my um, family, part of my family is from um, northern Iraq, from Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, and so I was excited to um, present um, Osnat Barazani. So I found these different renditions of her online. I don't know if they're, this is how she looked, but. Um, this is, a, she was a, a woman uh, born in 1590 in Mosul um, in Northern Iraq, modern Northern Iraq. She was actually referred to as a, a Tanait, not a Rav. Um, and, but kind of the, what, the, way she, her the way her life played out, she pretty much was um, at the head of a yeshiva. Um, um, and so I, I found a few sources that, that are letters um, from her um, explaining about her life. Um, she was the daughter of Rabbi, and we'll look at those in a moment, but she was the daughter of Rabbi Samuel Ben Atanel Halevi Barazani. Um, and he had many shivot in Mosul, um, um, he schools um, for, for Jewish learning. Um, he lived in poverty. Um, but, and he didn't have any sons, and so he taught us not um, taught taught her Torah, and she loved it. And um, let me just show you this um, 
Um, I never left the entrance to my house or went outside. I was like a princess of Israel. I grew up on the laps of scholars anchored to my father of blessed memory. I was never taught any work but sacred study. Um, and it's really interesting because when she married, she actually married one of um, her father's students um, and her cousin, uh, Rabbi Jacob Mizrahi. Um, and when she married, her father promised, like she, her father made like a agreement with the Chatan, with um, Harav Mizrahi, saying that she would not do any domestic work and that she would only focus on Torah learning. Um, and he, my father made my husband swear that he would not make me perform work. And he did as he had commanded him. From the beginning, the Rabbi Mizrahi was busy with his studies and no time, uh, and had no time to teach his uh, the pupils, but I taught them in his stead. I was a helpmate to him, for him, begging for support for the sake of father and the rabbis so that their Torah and name should not be brought to naught in these communities for I remain the teacher of Torah. Um, so it, it was her, her father, I mean, her father passed away and, and, and Harav Mizrahi became the head of the yeshiva, but um, he and he mostly focused on his studies and she really took the reins of the yeshiva and taught the students. And then when her husband died, she took, she officially took over running this yeshiva. Um, and um, her, like, I think when they, when um, both her father and her husband died, they were not great fundraisers. And, and she was a woman living in a society, I think, one of the things that's interesting about, about a lot of the stories that um, where we see women who are taking these leadership roles during these time periods where women didn't really have power is that, you know, things happen like people like husbands died and there was a space to <laughs> move in and then they and then they did. Um, and so I think she died um, in, not in poverty um, because it was very hard for her to fundraise as a woman uh, for the yeshiva. Uh, she's buried in Ahmedia in Kurdistan and people go up to her grave and, um, and um, she's remembered um, and there. And I just wanted to come back to um, one second. <clears throat> just a summary of the things that kind of we've learned about these two women, but um, I think they were all, these two women were Torah scholars who wanted to focus on Torah learning and not their traditional roles as women. They had access to power via men who were family members and the communities valued their opinions and wanted to learn from them. And um, we saw that both in Marat Victoria's talk and also um, uh, look, seeing that people are writing to them and there's um, interaction about legal questions, um, halachic legal questions. So I want to leave you with this question of what advice uh, do you imagine these women would give us today about learning and thinking about the question that we started with, um, the advice that the, the learned women of our time give us, um, just thinking how amazing and strong these women were, there were, they didn't have any role models of other women who were wanting to study Torah and they, and they found their way. And so I leave you with that kind of question to ask yourselves as you think about Usnat and um, the Virgin of Algier. Um, and uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamar. This is amazing. I think that a lot of us who are trying to find our way in terms of um, being in the rabbinic field or learning Torah um, sometimes feel like we're just coming at it and we don't have anyone behind us. And it's just so heartening to hear that there were these women who, who existed before us and and really also fought for what they really desired. So thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to uh, give you a, I mean, there's really nothing I can say. Tamar and, um, and Maharat Victoria kind of 
set it up for us. What is her Torah? Her Torah is a way for all of us to get together and to learn from each other, to learn about women uh, who maybe we, we would never have known about before, to learn from incredible teachers and to learn from one another so that it's not just a lecture, but it's a way where we're all talking to each other because we believe that the way to learn more is to get together with people who are different from us, right? So we bring together women, um, multi-generational, um, we come from different ages, different religious backgrounds, um, um, different income levels, different, when we were in Washington, we came from different places in Maryland and Virginia and Washington, and now we come from all these other places. And the thing that really I hope that you feel is that we are so glad if you come into our space, we are so glad that you are here. And uh, I want to show you, this is like my favorite picture from her Torah. This is a picture of our teachers from this past year. Look at all these amazing uh, women. And I just want to say to the Virgin of Algiers and to Osnat that I, that I wish they could look at those pictures because I think they would be so glad to see the women who have come after them. Um, um, Ariella, could you just go back for go back to the slideshow for a minute and go back one more. Okay, we go back. These are the topics that we covered this past year. We talked about spiritual gratitude, public shaming, gender, friendship, standing up to power. Uh, in the next year, we are so excited. We've been planning a series of sessions about what might our community look like when we come out of the pandemic? How can we rethink together as women what it might look like? And we're so excited for you to join us on that journey. All right, thanks, Ariella. Our next teacher, you heard her sing already, and that was amazing. And now you are going to hear her teach. I gave you, I gave you her bio before, so you can see it in the chat. But I do want to say about uh, Rabbi Tippi um is that this is what i think encapsulates her she signs all her emails blessings and love so every time i get an email from her i feel like i've got all these blessings and love coming at me and it's such a beautiful way it's really the way that she is in in her life and so um rabbi Tsipi, thank you so much for teaching us today and I'd like to talk to you today, but teach you about two extraordinary women that, uh, um, that really made a great influence on me. The first one is Lala Solika Hatzadeket and Yamna Mardoch. Lala Solika Hatzadeket is very famous among the Moroccan Jews and the Moroccan Muslims. In the past 200 years, Every year, on the fourth night of Hanukkah, there is a big hilula, a big celebration, a big studying. It's like a, almost like it's your site, but it's more uh, upbeat. It is a hilula for Soli Kahatsa decade with uh, words of Torah, with piyutin, with food, and with drinks. And this hilula, is taken place in Fas in the city of Morocco by the grave site of Lalla Solika. Lalla in Arabic comes from the word Laila, which means like the princess Solika. And it's attended by Jews and Muslims. So who is this Lalla Solika that everybody is celebrating? As a matter of fact, uh, she's buried next to two great Mekubalim, two great rabbis, Rabbi Yehuda Atari and Rabbi Avner Hatzorfati, the French ones. She is so revered that the people 200 years ago buried her next to these two Mekubalim. I was very fortunate 10 years ago to visit Morocco and the tour guys, of course, took us to see the square in Fes that is named after her, the square of La La Solica and uh, the gravesite. There are shows uh, right now in Israel, plays about La La Solica. There are piyutim that have been written about La La Solica. There are paintings 
by French and uh, Moroccan artists who are not Jewish that painted her picture. Now, who is this Lala Solika? Why is everyone reveres her so much? I've heard about her since I was three years of age. Solika was born in Tangier to a family, Hajual's family. Her father was a, a learner, her mother was a, a, a tzaddiket woman. And this Lala Solika was a beautiful young woman. She was um, knowledgeable, she was wise, she was smart. She would sit with her father and learn from the Torah every week. And everybody knew her as this extraordinary young woman. When she was 18 years old, um, the son of the Sheikh in Tangier, who was a Muslim, fell in love with her and asked for her hand. And of course, she refused. She said, I'm Jewish, you are a Muslim, and I'm not willing to forget my heritage and tradition. Wow. One of her Muslim friends, unfortunately, uh, went and uh, to court and said that Lala Solika uh, in her, uh, she was witnessing that she converted to Islamic, which was not true. So therefore, Lala Solika was called to court and said, you are a Muslim. Why are you denying now your religion? You became a Muslim. And Lala Solika said, I never did. I'm still Jewish. And she was, and they were trying to put pressure on her to marry the son of the Sheikh. Of course, she refused. Uh, the Jewish community hid her in uh, friends and, fa and relatives' homes. But her mother was taken as a hostage to jail. Solika knew that her mother will not survive in jail. And after a few days, she came out. And she was taken to jail. And the rabbi of Tangier, and the leaders in the Jewish community tried to convince uh, Solika to save her life, in order to save her life, just to convert to Islamic and uh, to marry the, the, the young man. And she refused. Wow. She said, I am going with my heart. I will not deny my heritage, my tradition, and my family and my people. As a matter of fact, the rabbi was trying to convince her and tell her, you know, even Queen Esther married Ahasuerosh to save her life and her people. She said, yes, but Queen, uh, Queen Esther did not uh, deny her religion. Queen Esther did not change her faith and religion. People in the community tried to redeem her, to give money so she will be redeemed, but it didn't help. And the reason was because at court, they believed that she was a Muslim now. Well, the time for the decree came and uh, unfortunately they said she's going to be put to death. Now to be put to death, she had to be moved to Fes because the king of Morocco had to sign the document the, that she is going to be put to death. She was taken to Fez and the Jewish community in Fez wrote letters to um, people in the governments in France, in Israel, and every place that they were able uh, to get in touch with to speak on her behalf. And letters came, people came from France, from Spain, from Israel to talk on her, um, on her behalf and it didn't help. The son of the king in face was very interested in this woman. He asked himself, what is so special about this girl that everybody is talking about her, trying to save her? I want to meet her. And he went to jail to meet Solika. And after speaking to her for hours, he fell in love with her too. And he said to her, Solika, marry me. I'm the son of the king just become a Muslim and you will be treated like a queen. 
and of course she refused. She was not going to leave her faith. He tried to beg her, he said, save your life, you know you are going to be executed. And she still refused. The story tells us that at the time when she, the ex, uh, when she was executed, Jewish people from many cities and all over the country came to witness, to just be there to try to give support. And unfortunately, she was, um, she was killed. And from then on, the uh, Jewish community realized what a strong woman what an incredible woman who was so faithful to her religion, to her tradition, to her belief, to her heart. And she said the last minute, I am willing to give, just before she died, she said the Shema Israel. And she said, I am willing to give my life to teach all the girls and the people in my community how important it is to be faithful to our belief, to be faithful to our heritage and to our traditions. And since then, my dear friends, every year on the fourth night of Hanukkah, there is a big Hilula that is being held in Morocco, in the city of Fez, in the square of Solika, La La Solika Hatzadikit. And people come Jews and Muslims, they come to her gravesite, they light candles and they pray and they believe. And many of them said that they witnessed the miracles. If women couldn't bear children, they prayed for a child. And some of them said, yes, we did have a child after that. Or if any woman wanted to find a nice husband, she would go to her gravesite and pray. And, and hopefully we'll find her men. All the tours that are coming from Israel to Morocco, one of the places that they are all taken is to Alala Solika Hatzadeke, to her graveside. And they pray and they study Torah by her graveside and they share wisdom. When I heard this story, when I was very little, it just taught me one thing, to be strong and to appreciate my heritage, my tradition. And I think this was like the spark that pushed me as an adult uh, to pursue my, my passion to become a rabbi and to follow the footsteps of my father and my grandfather. And I'm sure that from above, they have forgiven me <laughs> for doing something that was not so acceptable. The second woman that I wanna talk about who was a role model for me was Yamna Marduch, my grandmother, may she rest in peace. She was known as the Kabla, means the midwife, as the healer and as the medicine woman. She was in Bujad, close to the city of uh, Bnei Malal. It's in the Mount, in the Atlas Mountain. I went to visit in Israel 10 years ago, and as I approached the Jewish cemetery, the guard was following me as I was lighting candles on my grandparents, my uncles' uh, grave sites. And when I came to my grandmother's parents, because she was, um, she came to Israel and she passed away in Israel, Yamna Murdoch, he said he was lighting a candle too. And he said, do you know these people? Do you know their daughter? And I looked at him and I said, what do you have to do with it? He said, she delivered me. You see, I'm a Muslim. My mother was, every time she was pregnant, she would lose the babies when she was six, seven months pregnant. But when she was pregnant with me, Yamna Marduch, this healer, took my mother to her house and nurtured her for three months with medicines, with herbs, with uh, great food, until uh, the, my, uh, the day I, I was born. 
And when I was born, my mother didn't have any milk to nurse me, to breastfeed me. They didn't have formula in those days. And Yamna Murdoch nursed me for three months. And from then on, every week or two weeks, we will go to Mama Yamna. She was like my second mother to me. So now I am uh, an older man and I come to light candles at her parents' um, gravesite. And I remember her for uh, all those years. Another story that was told about her was when the son of the Sheikh, it was like the mayor, um, was injured. He injured his leg. Uh, the Sheikh had five daughters and that was his only son. He was about seven, eight years old. And the boy was extremely sick and the, the, his leg got infected. He got high fever and uh, he practically um, was uh, uh, dying. And uh, they didn't have antibiotic. His father, the sheikh, brought the best doctors to heal the child. And, um, and they said, the only thing we can do for the child is amputate, to save his life is to amputate his uh, leg. Of course, the father was not happy with that, but he heard about my grandmother and he asked for my grandmother to come to his house. Yamna Murdoch and Rabbi Davida Cohen, her husband, who was the chief rabbi in uh, the city of Bujad in Morocco, who attended the house and the sheikh said, look at the boy, I need you to heal him. She looked at the child and she was a little traumatized and she said, your highness, I don't think I can heal him. He's very, very ill. He might, I'm afraid to touch him. He might die. But he looked at her and he said, you are going to do your best because if not, I'm not going to be very happy. My grandfather tried to convince her not to take care of the child because he was afraid for her life. But she decided that she is going to do her best, her utmost effort to save this life. She took my mother who was 12 years old and they moved to the Sheikh's house for three weeks. For three weeks, she sat by that boy, left her husband and children and family at home and was trying with her herbs and medicine to heal the child. My ma I said to my mother, what was your task as a 12 year old? She says, my task was to drop in his mouth every 60, I would count till 60 and drop few drops of the medicine that she made for him. After three weeks, his fever went down and uh, he uh, was feeling a little better. My grandmother asked the sheikh, she says, I haven't been at my house for three weeks. I haven't seen my husband nor my kids. Can I take him now that he is feeling better to my house to do some physical therapy? And so I'm sure that he can walk. So they agreed and he stayed at my grandmother for three months until he was able uh, to walk and he was healed. And after that, all the doctors in that city and the nearby and everyone who tried to heal this child um, came to my grandmother and wanted to see what kind of medications, what did she use to heal this child? And I just wanna say that these are, because of the time, these are only two short stories that um, uh, I, I heard about this extraordinary woman. When she came um, to Israel, I was five years old, she continued uh, to heal people and, uh, um, and to be this Eshet Chesed. She was a strong, powerful woman, was also, except being a healer, except being um, a midwife. By the way, she delivered eight of my siblings. I'm the youngest of nine, seven daughters and two sons. I was the only one who was born in Israel and she didn't deliver me. I was born in a hospital. And this woman also was very knowledgeable. She, her father taught her how to read and write Hebrew. And, um, and uh, she knew all the prayers. She would chant all the Tehillim. She knew them practically by heart and had a wonderful, wonderful voice. So to me, here is another role model that uh, I thought of as I was pursuing my career and uh, wanting to become a rabbi like my father to do good in, uh, on this uh, planet, so.
Rabbi, this Rabbi, this is, is a, a my story of two extraordinary women that hopefully will inspire everyone around. Oh my gosh, I don't even know where to begin. It's like, it's simultaneous. This is a role model that we all need in our lives. Thank you so much for sharing her and where's the book or books that we can read to find out about her life. And wow, no pressure. I mean, that that's a lot to live up to. Oh my goodness, what an incredible, incredible story and matriarch to have in your own family. That's incredible. Rabbi, thank you. I, I, I'm so lucky because before I get to hand this off to Eliza to bookend um, and close us out, I get to sneak in here and just say thank you to our educators for just illuminating the night with these stories of incredible, incredible women who I had never heard of. And I'm constantly seeking just more role models that I can share with my own beautiful daughter and just women who inspire me. Thank you so much. Each one of you inspires me and the women you shared tonight were incredible. Um, I, I thank each of you and I thank Eliza for your vision and creativity and bringing us together through Torah and these beautiful traditions. Um, I'm gonna make a last request just to show our educators the respect for their time and their talent, their tremendous talent and go to spivad.org slash donate. Um, but what I really want to do is to share with you a really, really quick promise, 90 seconds survey that will help us do this even better. Um, because we have, as Eliza teased, like she teased, I, you have no idea what's to come in the year ahead. I am, I'm, I'm so excited. Thank you so much. There's a super, super quick poll if you don't mind filling it out while I'm talking. And while I thank each of you for having shown up for each other in such a beautiful way throughout this crazy, crazy, crazy year, despite everything, you've still shown up for one another in support and in sisterhood. And each one of you have added so much light to my life. So I just, with a very full heart, thank you. Um, Eliza, back to you. Thank you for filling out the survey and a reminder that I will stick around at the end. So please come say hello so I can wish you a happy Hanukkah in person. Thank you, Ariella. And thank you to all our teachers. I was just reflecting about how tonight it's really been like women from, I don't know what the earliest was, 15th century, let's say, all the way to our bat mitzvah girls who are turning bat mitzvah um, this year. It's just, it's so wonderful to feel connected to all these wonderful women past and present. So thank you so much to all of you. I wanna close by, um, by reciting a Misha Berach prayer that was said at, her, at, at Chag Habanot celebrations in the past. And uh, as I uh, recite this prayer, which has many blessings for all of us, I encourage you in the chat to bless one another, bless all the women in this room, um, with your own blessings. Mi shabirach avotenu, I'm sorry, imotenu hakdashot vahatahorot, sarav rifka rachav lea, Miriam haneviav avigail, Esther hamalka bat avichail, vachol hakilot hakdashot vahatahorot, hu yivarech et kol hakahal hakadosh haza, gdolot uktanot, hen vachol asher lahen. Malka d'alma hu yivarech yatchon, v'izakei yatchon, v'yishma v'kol tzlotchon, t'itparkum v'tishtezun, mikol tzara v'akta, v'yimemra d'ashem b'sadchem, v'yagen b'adchem, v'yifroz tukat shlomo aleichem. V'yita b'nechen ahava v'achva shalom v'reut, v'yisalek sinat chinam v'yibenechem, v'yishbor ol ha'goyim al tzavarechen. V'yikayem b'chem mikra sh'katuv, Hashem elokei avotechem, Yosef alechem kachem elef pa'amim. V'yivarech etchen kasher diber lachen, v'chen yiratzon v'nomar amen. May the one who blessed our holy and pure mothers, Sarah and Rebecca, Rachel and Leah, Miriam the prophetess and Abigail, and Queen Esther, the daughter of Abichail, and all the holy and pure communities bless this holy community, grown women and young women, them and all of theirs. The sovereign of the world should bless them and give them merit and listen to the sound of their prayers. May they be delivered and saved from all trouble and distress. 
and may the word of God be their support and shield them. May God spread a shelter of peace upon you and plant between you love and sisterhood, peace and friendship. And may God remove baseless hatred from among you and break the yoke of the nations from upon your necks. And may the verse be fulfilled in you. May the Lord, the God of your fathers, increase your numbers a thousandfold and bless you as he promised you. And so may it be your will. And let us say, Amen. Thank you, everybody. It's been wonderful learning with you. Chanukah Sameach, Chag Habanot Sameach. And thank you to our teachers and everybody who worked on this program. Thank you guys so much. It's so nice to be with you all. You too. You can unmute and say hi. We're not formal. Hi. That didn't come through. It sounds like hi. your mother had the gift of healing, Katya. Yeah. Your mother had the gift of healing. God-given gift. Yes. Baruch Hashem. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I went to visit her grave, and I saw her grave, not your mother, but the um, other woman you were talking about in Fez. When La I La Solica, yeah. La yes, La Solica. I, have a, yeah. I have a picture of that, of it. Yeah, yeah, it is incredible. That's one of... Yeah, and our, our guide, who wasn't Jewish, told us the story, but yeah, she had it on her list of I... people. I was laughing when uh, when I went on a tour and he said, now I will take you to the square of Lalla Solica. And he went on telling the story and I was just like smiling. It was incredible. It's really nice. Katja, what year was that? Rabbi Tsipi, I'm using Katja's computer. Uh, she was born in the 1816 and she, she was killed in 1834. Okay. Yeah, and Ariel, if you give me sharing per, per permission, I can share the, um, is Judith, I can share the photo. Of oh, the tombstone. awesome. And, okay, hang and on, I can. Katya, there was, when I went to high school, there was a sass. My name is Rabbi Tsipi, Ka that's Katya's computer, so I'm Rabbi oh. Tsipi. Okay. I'm sorry, Rabbi, when, okay. I, when I grew up in Lawrence, Long Island, Island, there was a, a, a family named Sassoon, S-A-S-S-O-O-N. -S -S and now I can't remember that, but I knew it was a lot, you were talking 60 years ago, but, uh, 50 years ago. but um, I wonder if there's a relation there. Uh, well, the, 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 the last name Sassoon, you can find it in, in, the, in, the, in Morocco, in Iraq, in Kurdistan, yeah. just like Gabay, like the, the, the woman that, uh, uh, the Marat was talking about the Gabay, mm. Gabay, Gabay. It's in Iraq, in Morocco, and yeah. in many places. Gabay means uh, leader. And by the way, in the Philippines, it means the leader also. <laughs> yeah, Ariel. So if you if you make me a co-host, then I can share it. God bless you and be well. And wait a minute. Who was talking? Just it was Judith. Awesome. I just sent you a private message. Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you so much for being here, Elaine. Elizabeth, thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Rachel and Dahlia, thank you for being here. I'm one of the oldest, but I know the least, and that's okay. There's nowhere to go but up. <laughs> Well, you've been saying that for so long, I don't believe it anymore. I love it. <laughs> Let me just find this, how, see how I can do this. Rabbi, I'm <laughs> going to share something with you quickly. My great-great-grandfather wrote the melody that we sing for the Shema. He was a Viennese cantor. I don't know if you know anything about cantors. I wouldn't accept that he's my great-great-grandfather. His name was Solomon Sulzer. I don't know if that means anything to you. It does to me because he's my great great grandfather. May he rest in peace. Okay. No, I don't see it. As she okay, let me up. just figure it out. You know what, Judith? If you send it to me, yeah, uh, I'll send it I to you. I can share it out with everyone. 
Yeah, because I can't figure out how to um, get into the albums. I've never done it. I tried doing it from from the photos, but it did it didn't pop up. So don't I'll worry have to about send it. it to you. But Honestly, you I have to collect all this awesomeness from everybody because everybody wants to learn more about these fabulous women, and I don't believe. Yeah, but Rabbi, you are you in California? Yes, I am in California in Berkeley. I'm a neighbor. Oh, I'm right that <laughs> you can wave to my daughter. She's in San Clemente. Uh, okay. <laughs> Not that far, a little far. Um, I want to let our amazing educators go because I'm pretty sure they have families with Hanukkah candles waiting for them. <laughs> finish with the song. Hanukkah Sameach, everybody. Thank you so much, Maharaj, Victoria. Thank you. This was Thank incredible. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. I would never say no to a song from you. You're amazing. You want us to sing? Laila, 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 sing. Chag dola, ha Laila. Ha Laila, 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 sing. Chag dola, ha Laila. Ha Laila, 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 sing. Chag dola, ha Laila. Ha Laila, ha Laila, sing. Chag dola, ha Laila. Ha Laila, no banu lismoa gaimachem. Rokdim sharim kula, no nehni bevekam smechim. Yalla. Happy Hanukkah to everybody. Thank you so much to our teachers and to Ariella and to everybody who worked on this. Thank you for inviting me. I hope we will be in touch more and uh, connect. Yes. Thank I, you. Speaking. I am so wowed. I'm just so wowed. <laughs> this, is, this was such a very interesting and inspiring program. Uh, my mother was Sephardic, but um, Ladino speaking um, uh, from uh, my maternal grandparents were from um, Turkey. Um, so um, it's a little also Sephardic, but they they spoke Ladino. They didn't speak um, um, the Arabic or whatever. Um, it, your um, heritage was, but very, very fascinating to me being being half Sephardic and learning about these really, really wonderful, impressive women, uh, just uh, absolutely fascinating that we never ever hear about or uh, uh, read about. And uh, anything that you can uh, give us as like a bibliography uh, as a follow-up uh, would be very much appreciated. And thank you so, 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 so much. And Ariella, thank you. So much for organizing it and thank you Aliza and and uh Rabbi Cooper. Thank you. Thank you, Ariella and You're Rabbi so and Aliza. I miss you, Aliza. It's so good to see you. Thank Love you. to your family, hon. Thank you. Thank you to yours too. It's so nice to see your face. Uh right back at you. <laughs> Janet, I love learning that about your family. I had no idea. I love learning something new. You learned so many new things tonight. Thank you so much for being here, Maria. Thank you, Judith. Thank you for showing up. Panina, I don't know you, but I'm so glad you're here. Judy, thank you for bringing up the Cranjic test. That was awesome and a great, great, great sidebar. And Yafa, I don't know you either. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you. This was absolutely wonderful. I'm a quick, two quick things. Will this recording be available to us at all? I think we could probably make that happen. We try, we try to keep our space um, protected so that people can feel comfortable to show up as they need. But you know what? Send me an email and we can talk about it. Thank okay? you. And Janet, my um, roots are also from uh, Sephardic Turkish um, and Ladino. 
from my family. It's amazing. Janet. It's wonderful. Yeah, thank you all. Hugs, Samaya. Thank you. Hugs, Samaya. Good night, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Hugs, Samaya. Hugs, Samaya. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Oh, Lisa, I'm sending you a telephone a hug. <laughs> Love to Josh, the whole family. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Ariel. Oh, thank you. Love Good night, you. guys. Good night. Thank you, Rabbi. Good night. Good night, Maria. Good night, Good night Rabbi. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to mention one thing. You know, tomorrow at uh, 3 p.m., the Gemini and the people in Israel and in Morocco, because there was a peace um, between Israel and Morocco, are having the big thing. Uh, I don't have the Zoom yet, but you can find it through Gemini. And uh, they will have uh, uh, Israelis and Moroccan. And, uh, Muslims uh, singing and belly dancing and speakers and I will be opening the event with the Hanukkah. So Rabbi Tzipi, if you send uh, me uh, Rabbi Tzipi, if you Hanukkah, send... lighting the Hanukkah. If Amazing. You send, yeah. If you send me the link, we can send it out to our okay. to our. She hasn't. Uh, Sabir hasn't sent it to me tomorrow morning, but I will send. I'll definitely send it to you. It's very interesting to see, you know, Jews and Muslims and uh, and people all over uh, the world are going to be participating at uh, this uh, Zoom. So yeah. And do you, did you say what time tomorrow? They said that, oh, California time. It's three p.m. So, so it'll be six here, I think. Okay. You're your mother is a very inspiring woman, Rabbi. And a song, and then there will be a beautiful program, apparently. So it seems like you're a chip off the old block. Do you know what that means? No. <laughs> you're just like you got a lot from your mom. Oh, thank you. My mother was a, an extraordinary woman, also. You I, know, I was laughing uh, with my friend. I said, "Yes, I come from like there are twenty generations of male rabbis." But the women, they were all, the, the, the women were driving the boats. They were the strong ones. <laughs> and, I love uh, it. Thank you very, very much. God bless you. Of course, you too. And Chag Sameach to all of you. And may Chag the light Sameach. of Hanukkah illuminate your life. May your wishes, uh, you know, become reality. And may you find strength within you, within your heart to pursue anything you want in life. And may the, the, the Shekhinah of these women, like Lala Soli Kabia, hover upon us to help us, you know, to, to do wonderful things in life. Amen. 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 Rabbi. Blessings and love. You're totally Thank right. You, Rabbi Alisa. Alisa. Thank you, Rabbi Alisa. Thank you. Okay. Laila Tov. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Good night. Thank you. Boy, it's, I'm close. We're closing the place down. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much, Ariel. You're welcome. Have a great you, night. You too, honey. Ariel, if yes. I want to just send a check to you, your address made out to Saviva, can I do it that way? Yes, and thank you. Great. Yes. Helene, also, Helene, I just wanted to tell you, my husband's a rabbi, but he was trained as a cantor originally, and I know he has mentioned your great-grandfather. Great, great. I, what a it's a blessing, and I was a, I'm a re, I, music is my life. Solomon Sulzer. Yeah, and um, thank you, uh, Austrian or um, yes, Viennese. Yeah, yeah. We were we were in his shul. We the Stadt Temple in in Vienna. Yeah, we were there. And it was the only synagogue that didn't yeah. say, was yeah. not bombed in because, the Holocaust. Well, because the Nazis were in the building. Well, it looked like it, it didn't look like a synagogue. I've never been there, and I probably won't. But his music is in me, and yeah. it's a blessing from God. How do you like that? So you yeah. were there. Yeah, 